Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Ave Maria Press Professional Development Webinar Series. In this webinar, Mark Hart will share some practical strategies for changing things up in our ministries. My name is Erin Pierce. I am the Ministry Resources and Special Initiatives Manager at Ave Maria Press. Everyone in the audience is muted today, but you are able to ask questions. Questions can be sent to our presenter using the question section of the GoToWebinar panel, and I'll read as many of those as possible at the end of the presentation today. This webinar is being recorded, and I will send you a link to the recording via email tomorrow. With that, I would like to welcome and introduce our presenter today, Mark Hart also known as the Bible Geek, is the Chief Innovation Officer at Life Teen International. He is an award-winning producer of Bible study DVDs and the author or co-author of more than 20 books. Mark, thank you so much for being with us today. Nice to see you, Erin. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to go ahead and make you presenter. Yes, that's right. You make me presenter. Yes, I'm going to present right. stuff. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say hello to everyone. Uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, wow. That's embarrassing. Uh, you don't know, like, like, look, look at your own headshot. That's just awesome. Um, so, so glad to have everybody here today. Why don't we take a second, uh, if we can, to begin with prayer. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, Lord Jesus, thank you for the gift of today. Uh, Lord, thank you for all of the fine souls who are gathered on this webinar, both live and those who will be watching it at a later time. Lord, I ask that you would uh, bless their efforts, whether paid or volunteer, whether full-time, part-time, regardless of what ministry or group they serve within your church, Lord God, thank you for their service. Lord, I ask that you would bless them, that you would hold them close to your sacred heart. Mother Mary, that you would kneel beside them. St. Joseph, you would kneel beside them and pray when they pray, and pray for them when they fail to. And Lord God, we ask that you pour your sacred blood over not only our parishes and our ministries and our, our meager efforts to build your kingdom here on earth, but pour them over our sacraments, over our families, over our homes. Keep us safe from the slings and the arrows of the evil one. And Lord, please pour out your spirit in a bold way that we would follow you each and every day. Lord, grant us life until our work is over and work until our life is done. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I remember uh, when I first started working in the parish. Now, this was um, this would have been right out of college, uh, mid '90s, and I remember my first parish staff meeting. Uh, I knew my pastor. Uh, he was a very passionate pastor, very uh, passionate priest. Loved the faith, you know, just strong, strong uh, presence. But an administrator, he was not. I remember my first staff member, my first staff meeting, not because uh, it was so memorable and so amazing. It wasn't like the angels sang. I mean, if anything, I think the angels wept. I remember because of this particular staff meeting, my pastor fired our head maintenance person in the middle of the meeting. I literally been on staff for about three days, and I was just like, I was just mortified. It was this very, very, very awkward moment. Um, because I, I had never seen someone uh, fired live before, so that was exciting. Uh, but it just made whole, the whole situation very, very tense and very awkward. So, <laughs> I, my, needless to say, every single staff met me in which after that, I was always very mindful of getting my job done, um, that I might be heading out with a cardboard box at the end of it. Um, but I, I should have story because it was, it was my first introduction to parish life, my first foray into parish life. I was the parish youth minister. I was concerned with the middle schoolers, the high schoolers, confirmation, that kind of thing. So I wasn't really accustomed to um, the, how the inner workings of a parish worked. I had always attended mass. I was involved in my youth group. I, you know, I, I had volunteered, but I'd never really served on a parish staff before. And over the subsequent 30 something years, um, I've come to find out that a lot of parishes are really, really dysfunctional. Um, and I don't mean that in a, in a, in a by the way, certainly there are countless that are functioning, thriving very well. but I came up to learn the hard way through having different pastors and then interacting with parishes. And this is parishes internationally, domestically, in every diocese you can think of, parishes big and small, rural and urban, um, super conservative, you're not so conservative, different kind of theological styles, orthodoxies, um, suburban, I mean, like you name it, I've been in these parish meetings before, parish staff meetings before, I've given parish missions, I've gone in and, and done talks and getting to meet and, and get to know people. You start to see certain trends happen in ministry. And this has nothing to do specifically with, you know, post-pandemic, pre-pandemic, just speaking as a whole. I'm going to speak in some generalities today and realizing that it's hard, it's hard to, uh, to speak with specificity. You have to speak sort of in generalities a lot of the time. So I'm speaking in generalities today 
Um, so if I say anything that I don't want anybody to take any offense to anything, um, I'm speaking generalities just so we can get a, get a broad stroke, kind of a, a broad stroke um, idea of parish life. And maybe some of the things we can do, some of the traps we fall into, and some of the solutions we might be able to look into to get out of that ministry monotony. I would say that my experience at the first parish, the way I would probably describe it would be uh, a pyramid. And most parishes, I think, kind of function as a pyramid, the pyramid on the left. That is that, that you have the pastor, you know, and then you'll have your parochial vicar, you know, you'll have your, your parish, you know, your, your, your priests, and then maybe you know, your deacons or any other you know, religious. And then you kind of go to that next parish administrator level, right? You know, I'm going to be a parish administrator, I'm going to be a parish, you know, it's finance or it's DRE or whatever it is, people who oversee ministries. And then you have like the next layer, if, if you're a bigger parish, the next layer of, of professionals and, and hires, you might be saying, hey, we have, we have two people at the parish, okay? I am the parish. But in, in most parishes, we're going to have a couple different layers of staff. And you see that the pyramid is going to kind of build and kind of disseminate and distill down from the pastor to the religious to the you know the executive team by the parish and then some of the key staff members and some of the junior staff members all the way down to finally the people who volunteer in ministry who don't just head them up and weren't paid for it but volunteer in ministry and then the faithful that they serve and that's really the way that i think most people look at our church as an institution look at parishes as an institution look at jobs and, and organizations we oftentimes will, will look at it through that lens but the reality is, is that if we really are supposed to be the hands and feet of Christ, little Christs, if we really had the proper perspective on our Holy Father, the Vicar for Christ, the servant of all, that really we should be looking at our parishes, we should be flipping the model. We should be looking more like a pyramid on the right, where those of us in leadership are not at the top, but at the bottom. And we did this many years ago uh, at Light Team. We, we saw that um, that we were serving parishes, but the way we were setting up a lot of our shipments, our programs, the curriculums we were writing, our events, some of the designs were unintentionally becoming about what makes the most sense for us as a staff and then those we serve. And we, we prayed about it a lot and said, what if we flip this model? What if we flip the pyramid upside down where we're the lowest, where we're, we're the servants of all, where the top of the pyramid now becomes every soul on the planet, right? Not just every soul that's darkening the door of your parish, but all those within your parish boundaries, all those who might darken the door of your parish, every soul, Catholic or not at this point. What if you said the top of the pyramid is every soul in your, in your, in your deanery, every soul in your you know, parish boundaries. And then beneath that is every soul who's coming to Mass. And then beneath that is our, our, you know, our, you know, the, those who volunteer in ministry. And then underneath that are those who are paid to be on staff. And underneath that, to a point where you distill it all the way down where the pastor and the ministry leaders are actually the lowest, they're actually the bottom of the pyramid. That if we said we're going to write our goals and objectives every year, our mission statements, our goals and objectives, our stretch goals are all going to be based upon serving the top of the pyramid, those souls. It's not going to be about what makes sense for me or my area or my ministry, my specific corner in, when it comes to ministry. But it's going to be about those that I serve and those I could potentially serve if I think bigger, if I could do a more effective job. You know, it says in Proverbs 29, 18, it says the people without a vision will perish. And I think that's close. I would offer this. Of course, it's close, it's scripture. <laughs> but the people without a vision will perish. I would offer this. I would say the parish without a vision will perish. And I don't just mean in parish closures or in clusters or anything like that. I mean that if a parish, if a pastor, and those who are responsible in leadership and those who lead ministries, if we do not have a bigger vision, then our ministry efforts are going to perish. If we get so caught up in the way we've done things, we become beholden to the way we've done things and aren't willing to allow the Holy Spirit, invite the Holy Spirit in to breathe, to open our minds, open our hearts, open our, broaden our perspective. If we don't do that, then really it's on us. It's not on the Holy Spirit. And oftentimes, you know, the Holy Spirit kind of scares us, right? We know, we know God the Father, he's, oh, he's in heaven on the throne. And Jesus, you know, he's on the cross or he's in the tabernacle. You know, he's next to, he's next to the Father. Then you get to the Holy Spirit, we're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Put the dove in a cage because you can't, the Holy Spirit's going to cause you to do things you don't want to do and encourage you to say things you don't want to say. You can't control the Holy Spirit. That, that dove's flapping all over the place. Put the dove in the cage, you know. Oftentimes you get very uncomfortable. But why did he give us the Holy Spirit? It's such an audacious claim in John 16. Jesus says, it's better for you if I go. And that was like the thing in these moments. You have to think the apostles, I mean, they're probably like Bartholomew or somebody, you know, he says, hey, um, I'm sorry, boss. I'm sorry, I have a question. Uh, how can it be better for us if you go? Like everywhere you go, you're multiplying loaves, you're walking on water, you're raising the dead, we're VIPs, this is the best. 
that's an audacious claim by Jesus, but it's true. It's better for you if I go so I can send you the Holy Spirit, the guardian of our church, the, 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 the leader of our church. So how can we as a parish expect to fulfill Christ's mission on earth and to fully embrace the charisms of the spirit unless we constantly invite the spirit in? And what is the spirit going to bring? A spirit of change. Isn't it interesting that the triangle is, is, the, is that, that scientific symbol for change, right? That delta. It's, we're going to invite the Holy Spirit in and allow the Holy Spirit to unleash the hidden greatness, not only of us and our souls, but the hidden greatness of our parish to enliven the talents of those in the pews, not just those in leadership. And that's why it's so important to call the Holy Spirit in. And that's why it's so important as a ministry leader that we have a little thing I like to call perspective. Now, my original pastor I spoke to you about, he lacked perspective, right? He would look at a situation and he would just react to it. And unfortunately, he had put an administrator in place, um, you know, God rest his soul, um, who also lacked that same perspective. Now, it, it's one thing if you have someone who, should, who lacks perspective, but then someone who has it, a man who has it, who can kind of counteract and counterbalance, right? If you're not fortunate enough that the person in leadership has a proper perspective or is reactive instead of being proactive, then it's really important to set them up for success, to, to become that sounding board or to be, to be able to somehow create systems and processes where people can offer perspective. Now, perspective is a really important word because this is where you can go from being reactive to proactive. Perspective comes from the Latin perspicere, okay, which means not to look at, but to look through. Not to look at a problem, to look through a problem, right? Um, it, it, a perspective allows one not to get wrapped up in the emotionalism or reactionism. It allows us not to get wrapped up and in, in beholden to the way we've always done things, those sacred cows of ministry that exist. You know, well, we, this is what we do during Lent. This is where we put the decorations. And this is how we do the service. This is what we do during Lent. This is what we do during Advent. This is what we do you know, during ordinary time. And we can fall into those traps. Well, this is how we do confirmations. This is how we do sacramental prep. This is how we do, you know, our, our engaged couples. You know, when when someone says, well, this is how I do it. I've been doing this for 20 years. You know, this is how you do it. Well, have you been innovating for 20 years or have you been doing the same thing 20 times, right? And are we are we changing with the times? Are we communicating with people differently? Because obviously, you know, a lot of us, we're, we're still keeping Catholic realtors in business and publishing our bulletins. And that's fine and good and great. But is that where people really want to get all their information? Are we catering to one specific cross section, one specific age demographic? Are we communicating in a 2024 in a 1973 way or a 2000 way? And this is where we have to be able to be willing to say, I'm going to take a step back. And this is where I take a step back and I pray and all the Holy Spirit open my eyes, open the eyes of my mind, open the eyes of my heart. Help me to see this clearly. Help me to look through the situation. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, I live in, in Phoenix. It's <laughs> it's terrible today. It's 65. I know a lot of you watching this are in sub-zero temperatures right now. I know even Aaron, when she introduced it, we were talking before the webinar, and it's negative, <laughs> negative four or five or something in South Bend. Um, I was outside the teacher yesterday just to rub it in. Uh, but... I was, it was a, it was a very uh, atypical day in Phoenix. This happened several years ago and I had to take a early morning, like sunrise flight. So I get to the airport and it was very gray. It was raining and it only rains about you know, two hours a year here. Um, so, but it, it, it's amazing when you get in the rain, it just really brings our spirits down out here in the desert. So I'm on the plane and I'm looking out the window and it's gray and it's somber and it's raining. And I'm thinking, oh, it's five o'clock. I don't want to be going cross country right now. I don't want to leave my family. I was in a really sad mood. It was a very down mood. Um, just having a pity party, you know, and see, you know, 14A or whatever. And all of a sudden we taxi and we start to take off. As we take off, we, we kind of ascend into the clouds. All of a sudden the rain starts to lift and we break through the clouds. And as we come out of the clouds, it is bright. I mean, blindingly bright, like, like, um, like, like, like a vampire, you know, movie, like a bright lights are coming in. And it was so stunning and so amazing and so blinding. And I remember as I was praying, I said, oh, Lord, thank you for this. Thank you for the sound. Like, it really lifts my spirits. And it was as though God was saying to me, Mark, like, this is how I see things all the time. You get trapped in yourself. You go you know, into yourself. You have pity party and navel gazing. You get trapped in those, those moments down on earth where it's gray and it's somber and it's raining. This is what he means through the prophet Isaiah. He says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth or as high as my thoughts are above your thoughts. You see, God in that moment reached down and lifted me up to give me a divine perspective to look through my pity party and to be able to realize that, you know what, he had called me to get on this plane and go do this, and he was with me. 
right? And that he, he exists above the drama. He exists above the clouds. He sees perfectly. He sees all knows all. And oftentimes, when things happen in ministry, right, things aren't going our way, we just react to it. Well, this is the what we have money to do. So this is how we're going to do it. Well, this is how we always done it before. This is how we're going to do it. That's monotony. That's how we fall into monotony is to say, okay, well, why are we doing things this way? Because this is how we've always done it. And that's not really good leadership. That's not really how we want to do things, right? So to be able to have the divine perspective is to be able to say, Lord, Holy Spirit, I give you permission, lift me up. That's really what mass is. Mass is not God coming down to us, you know, for an hour. Mass is the Lord reaching down and lifting us up into heaven for an hour. If we have the right perspective, we have ears to see, eyes to see and ears to hear. And this is the challenge, especially when you're in leadership or even if you're not in leadership, but you're working or ministering or volunteering in ministry, is to be able to keep proper perspective. Be able to say, okay, we're never going to have as many volunteers as we need. We're never going to have the budget we're going to need. Um, we may never even have the amount of people we want to get. But are we asking the right questions? Are we doing the right things? Are we open to change? Or are we beholden to the past? Because as people continue to change and, and social media continues to change and communication styles begin to continue to change, we say, well, the church doesn't change. The church is, is 2,000 years old. Yes, the church is evergreen. And the church, even though her teachings may not change, the articulation of those teachings will need to change because the people we are speaking to continue to change because the society they live in continues to change. So we first have to pray for that divine perspective. Lord, help me to see things bigger, to see things differently. Second, when you have a problem, how do you go about solving it? There was a block of marble that sat outside of a cathedral in Italy for four decades. And all the greatest artisans and all the greatest you know, sculptors and artists all came to look at this big, huge, giant, 16 foot, 12,000 pound piece of marble, right? They called it the giant. Even Da Vinci came and looked at this, this stunning marble, but he couldn't do anything, do anything with it. The artist couldn't do anything with it. That's why it sat outside this cathedral. Because at one point, an artist had tried drilling through the marble and there was this gaping hole going through the bottom base of it. So all these artists are trying to figure out how can we work around this flaw? And most of them, including Da Vinci said, it can't be done. We can't work around such a sizable flaw. We'll go find another piece of marble. Until one artist, Michelangelo, came and saw this marble and had it transported to Rome, where he toiled for 18 months working on this giant, the giant, this big piece of marble with the hole running through it. And at the end of that, those 18 months, he unearthed the famous statue of David, the giant killer. He took the rock and turned it into the rock slinger. And they asked him one time, they said, how did you know you could do this? He says, it was simple. When I saw the hole, I knew if I turned it to this degree, to this ratio, I could carve around it. He said, David was always there. I just had to unleash him. You see, Michelangelo refused to see the hole. What he saw was the potential. He had divine perspective. So you have to ask yourself in your ministry, in your parish, if you want to get out of monotony, to say, okay, what are our holes? Where are our gaps? What are our challenges? And how can I use those challenges to my advantage? What are our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats? SWOT analysis are great. But to be able to say, okay, um, we don't have enough participation in the parish, right? We don't get more people from the pews to participate you know, in parish life. Um, some, the same people always come when we have something. It's the same 50 people always come, same 100 people always come. How do we get more people to come? Maybe your problem is we don't have enough staff. We don't have enough budget. We don't have enough volunteers. Oftentimes, we let that hole deter us from fulfilling our mission, and that is to bring as many souls to God as possible. We become the da Vinci or the other artists who see the hole, and, and we're so overwhelmed by the hole, this glorious work that could be done goes undone. And we go back to, well, because of the hole, I can't do X, Y, or Z. So I'm just going to do things the easy way, do things the way I've always done them. Because, you know, no matter what I do, it's going to be the same people. No matter what I do, I'm not going to have enough staff. I'm not going to have enough budget, right? We let the whole dictate the outcome. Instead of letting the outcome, our desired outcome, the beauty, art, like Michelangelo's David, letting that dictate how hard we work on it. Michelangelo stopped, prayed, thought through the problem, and then unleashed and unearthed something beautiful. Next, when we meet... When we have meetings, okay, oftentimes in a parish meeting, a ministry meeting, we come together with an agenda. But we oftentimes put the process over the people. And we put the agenda above the prayer. And this is a trap that I'd fallen into like 25 years ago when I first started in, in ministry uh, with Light Team. I would get together with my staff 
and I would bring, you know, my, my, my leaders into a room and we would always start with prayer. We were good about that. We would start with prayer. But we went to the chapel. We started with just perfunctory prayer for two, three minutes. And then it was, boom, here's my agenda. Here's what we have to go through. Here's a talking point. So we got to get stuff done. But I was realizing that, you know what, it was becoming a utilitarian transactional kind of relationship with my staff members was that they were going through things and I either didn't know, or I wasn't showing that I cared, or wasn't taking the time to really invest in them and in people as souls. I was so concerned with efficiency and processes that I wasn't putting people first. But the minute we flipped it, and I started to say, you know what we're going to do? No, we're actually going to start with longer prayer. What if our meetings were not five minutes of prayer and 55 minutes of meetings? What if they were 30 minutes of prayer and 30 minutes of meetings? What if they were 45 minutes of prayer and 15 minutes of meeting? It would force everybody to become more prepared, force everybody to be more efficient. Then we begin to adapt something else that we do with our staff. We'll, we'll, we'll come together when we start a meeting. We'll say, okay, tell me how you are doing personally, professionally, spiritually, and allow people to, to offer a scale of one to 10 to really share what's going on in their lives. It grows us in empathy. It grows us in professional respect. And it also alerts us and allows us to be able to not just walk with and pray with people that are, that are really part of our staff family, right, our parish family, but it really allows us a deeper insight into how to be Christ to them and what the Holy Spirit's doing in their life. And as we do that, we become more invested in one another. Well, when we become more invested in one another, now the silos come down. We're not territorial. This happens a lot of times in parishes. You'll see that ministries become siloed and they become kind of territorial. And people argue over uh, the parish hall, the meeting space, meeting times, their corner of the budget. Don't touch my thing. Don't touch my, I mean, everything gets labeled. There's, there's nothing that's familial. It becomes very corporate. And that was not the idea of the early church. When you go back and read the epistles, go back and read the gospels, that wasn't Christ's vision of the church, the siloed corporation. The idea of the church was, was to come and to weep, weep with me and serve with me and eat with me and laugh with me and cry with me. There's a, there's a time for everything, a season for everything, he tells us in Ecclesiastes. Remember, the parish without a vision will perish, but a parish that puts time and energy into caring more about people than process and caring more about prayer than agenda are the parishes that flourish because God blesses those efforts. Because our God's not ever I've done in generosity. Whether you work on staff as a volunteer, whether you work on staff as paid staff, part-time staff, make the office a workspace and make the chapel your office, and things will change over time. Next. Don't be afraid to ask the hard questions. Oftentimes we ask questions that we already know the answer to, or we ask questions that will lead to uh, us being affirmed or us being validated. But do we ever just start being and say, hey, um, are we really being effective? Like if you're working youth ministry, are teens really having transformational encounters with Jesus Christ? Or is it just about um, just like getting them to come to youth group and just about um, changing their, uh, their attitude? You know, about getting them to mass. Right? Are people coming to mass really having transformational, transformational experiences of the sacraments, or are they just merely fulfilling an obligation? And what maybe, what can we do better liturgically? Okay, rather than just blaming Father homily, what can we do better liturgically when it comes to varying up music during the seasons? When it comes to uh, environment? When it comes to our hospitality, welcoming people in? When it comes to our announcements? When it comes to the articulation of the gospel that week, or how how that gospel is to be lived, and how we do hospitality beforehand, afterhand? How do we do our lecture training? How do we do our usher training? How do we do our Eucharistic minister training? What are the things we're doing that can give people a more purposeful experience of the liturgy? When it comes to adult catechesis, when it comes to RCIA, when it comes to um, marriage formation, right? When it comes to um, how we care for our seniors, how we care for our littles, are we asking the hard questions? Are we, are we willing to say, what else can I do? Oftentimes it becomes, well, what, let, what, I have too much to do. There's too many things. I, I can't. Are we willing to say, hey, maybe are we doing too many things? What if instead of doing 10 things as a ministry, we did five things really, really well? And then when people really engage, then we we can sort of move back up to 10. That's what God's calling us to do. But oftentimes we're afraid to ask the hard questions for a few reasons. One, I'm afraid if I ask the hard question, I'm going to have more more work to do with less pairs of hands to do it or less budget to do it. So we're afraid the Lord's not going to provide. That's not being faithful. All doubt, I think it's uh, Fulton Sheen said, all doubt is on its most fundamental level atheistic because there's a want for trust in God. So we can't go into it saying, well, I don't want to ask that question because that's just going to add more work to my plate. That's just going to add more stress to my life. If we function like that, then we're not really putting our faith in the Lord, right? If we say, well, if, uh, if, if we do it this way, um, it might be a poor reflection on the job I've done. And that's not, I mean, that, that's going to hurt my feelings or not be validated or put my job in jeopardy, my role in jeopardy. Well, if that's the case, then really, again, who's the Lord? 
If we're saying, I'm afraid that this might reflect poorly on me, well, then it's time to take a hard look at ourselves and say, you know what, maybe I need to do things differently. Maybe it's time to do an anonymous survey for those people that I serve in ministry. Maybe it's time to do an anonymous survey with the parish and say, how, how would you rate our how would you rate our liturgy experiences? How would you rate our classes? How would you rate our ongoing formation? How would, how would you rate uh, the job of doing with your kids? How would you, uh, as a senior, how would you rate our opportunities for you? How would you, I mean, to, to offer an anonymous survey, it's scary because you're giving everybody the opportunity to say something you might not like. And oftentimes, you know, when we, when we retreat back into, especially if you work in a parish, you retreat into, well, they don't know how hard my job is. They don't know how hard my life is. They don't understand that I don't have X, Y, or Z. They don't understand fathers this way, or the, or the ministry leaders this way, or the ministers this way. They don't understand how, how we try to you know, make water out of, you know, make wine out of water with no budget and, and nothing in the plate. They don't understand. Well, immediately, again, that becomes reactive. We're not giving the people that we serve, if that, if that pyramid is really upside down, people we serve who are at the top, we're not giving them an opportunity to tell us how they want to be served. The same way, if I look at my wife and I say to her, tell me how I can better love you. I don't, if I walk into this, to a situation and say, honey, affirm me. Tell me what a great husband I am, because <laughs> it's clear that I am. If I walk in and say, tell me how awesome I am, tell me what a great husband I am, I've not set her for, her for success. But if I walk in and I say, sweetheart, I know I'm not perfect. You know I'm not perfect. What are some ways that I can love you better on a day-to-day -day basis? What are some things that I can do to show you how much I love you, to, to love you better, to become a better husband, a better father, a better partner, a better friend, a better Christian man. And after seven or eight hours of me taking copious notes now, if I, if I say it to my wife, now that sends a message. I don't claim to have it all figured out. I'm a work in progress. I am that statue of David. And every day the Lord's come in and, and he's just smoothing away the rough edges, right? And why can't we say the same thing in ministry? To walk in and say, no, my ministry is perfect. Well, no one's gonna say your ministry is perfect. To say, well, my ministry is above average. Great. Let's get it from above average to great. My ministry is great. Okay, let's get it to stellar. Let's get it to the best in the diocese. Well, it is the best in the diocese. Let, then let's get it. Let's let's make some saints. Are we making saints? And if not, why not? And you know how you start making saints? You start with yourself. You allow the Lord to reveal your rough edges. You ask yourself the hard questions. And you look at the work of your hands and say, how can I do this better? Now, that's, there's no shame in that. It's not saying that you didn't do well. But how can I do it better, Lord? And that is really beautiful. Next. Every year, strategize at least three new initiatives. Okay? Those can be small initiatives, big initiatives. They can be internal to just your ministry team and your parish, or they can be external that you offer to the entire parish and beyond. But pray, pray at the beginning of every year. This is a great time to do it in January. And not to say, what can we implement in February? You know, maybe it's too soon to implement something different during Lent. But maybe it's not. Hey, how can we how can we do something different for Lent this year? You know, it starts in a few weeks. How can we do something different for Advent this fall? How can we do something different for back to school, right? When when the ministries are really popping and thrive in September, when they start to ramp up. How do we do something different for you know the RCIA process? How can we do something different to start asking those questions now and pray through it now? To go to the chapel with a blank sheet of paper and a journal and just say, Lord, what do you want? What do you desire? And to think, hey, maybe it's a small initiative, but maybe it's something bigger. Maybe during this during this time of Eucharistic revival, we say, "Hey, you know, what? we're going to do uh, we're going to do a series of nights of adoration, or we're going to we're going to do a Eucharistic procession, or we're going to do a, a, a mini series on the theology of the Eucharist, and, and we're going to encourage you to bring your non-Catholic friends and neighbors and coworkers and family members, you know, and you find that really really charismatic man or woman in your parish or in the diocese, or bring somebody in who has who has a charism for this, and just say, come, be here, share, to get some new opportunities beyond just the normal liturgical calendar." And to be able to say, no, we're going to have a, we're going to have a, you know, parish-wide festival. We started doing a, a festival for our parish feast day about 10 years ago because it was an idea that came out of a parish staff meeting, you know, and some people on the, on the pastoral council beyond, the, beyond the uh, staff who said, hey, we can, we can do this. We can pull out, we can food trucks. We'll bring in live music and we'll have a special feast day mass and we'll have, what well, we will have entertainment. Well, it's going to be, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's literally changed the parish. It's, it's exploded to a point where over the last few years, we'll, we'll pull easily, you know, thousands of people to come to this feast day. You know, it's just, it's unbelievable. But it really grew out of the staff and volunteers and the pastoral council just thinking big and saying, how can we bring more glory to God? Let's try a new initiative. If it doesn't work, no harm, no foul. Because you know, you're going to have ideas. Some are going to be bad ideas. That's okay. At least you tried something. At least you tried something. Not everything has to be a home run or a, a grand slam. Any baseball fan knows. You know what? Hey, just get on base. Get on base, and that's gonna eventually you're gonna get around home plate. You know, every football fan knows. Hey, it might not be a touchdown, but a field goal is still three points. It's worthwhile to try new things. 
but it takes everybody widening that perspective, thinking about the, the, who we're really trying to serve in that pyramid, saying, I'm not going to just be beholden to the holes and the problems. No, we're going to try and, to, try and do something new, not for my glory and not for my resume, for your glory, God, for your resume. Next, it's time to reassess what success looks like. Oftentimes in the, in the parish, on the parish level, ministry level, it comes down to uh, how many people are coming to mass, how much money is coming in the basket, right? How many people came to that event? Um, you know, how fast can we build a new building or whatever it is? How many kids do we graduate from the school? And those are all great. And, and, and those certainly are markers. But what if we reassess success and said, it's about souls, not sales, right? This is not about transactional, but transformational. What if we said, it's not about how many people are in the pews on Sunday, but how many people are in the pews Monday through Saturday, right? Where this has become so real for them that it's beyond a Sunday obligation, that they just desire the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. They desire the sacrifice of the mass. Are we willing to change mass times to allow more people to be able to go earlier in the morning or in the evening? Are we willing to vary up the schedule, even if it makes our job as a parish more difficult? If it's about souls, are we willing to say, you know what, I'm going to add in more confession times if you're the priest, right? Or I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to alter the time for this. We're going to add in more, more prayer. We're going to start having healing masses, prayer masses, whatever. Are we willing to try new things? Is it about how many people are showing up for a ministry you know, event? Or is it about how many people are in line for confession? How many people are in the chapel, you know, just stopping by on the way home from work or the way into work? If we reassess our successes and say it's not about just the basket of the plate, although that is a reflection oftentimes of how we're doing, it's more than that. Are we seeing with our own eyes people who are changing, people who are, who are having these experiences, people who are growing into little Christs and then wanting to share it with other people? Next. We have to define our wants versus our needs. Oftentimes, we, what we will declare what we want. I want this for my ministry. I want this from, from the budget. I want this, you know, what, this role, this resource, this, this. But oftentimes, we don't really communicate our needs. We'll tell people what we want. Well, want means um, if I get it, great. If I don't, okay. A need is I need this to get this done. And you'll see this play out, especially when it comes to things like, like uh, when, when people read the announcement at the end of Mass or they look in the bulletin. We're not very good. We're not very thoughtful in how we communicate our needs. I remember this, when I was a youth minister, I had, I, I, I was, I was working, I mean, I was, I was calling the high schools. I was introducing myself to teens. We had, when I started, we had 10 teens. And after my first three months, we had about 110 that were coming. I mean, I was, I was going to every band practice, every day, every palm practice, every football practice, every basketball practice. I was just living in all these different high schools, introducing myself and all these kids started coming. And I wanted more core members. I wanted more, you know, mentors and leaders to help lead small groups, to help lead nights. And I kept saying, I want, instead of I need. And the minute I got up at masses and said, I need help. We have all these young souls coming and I need help. And even if you're afraid of teenagers, even if you don't you know, know how to do this, I'll help you, I'll train you. But I just, I need men and women who love their faith and who are not afraid to share it with a really scary cross section. And overnight, I went from two volunteers to 30. It was about communicating needs. It was when all of a sudden a bunch of those kids couldn't afford to go on retreat. And instead of just you know, saying in the bulletin, you know, hey, here's the cost of the retreat, me standing at, at coffee and donuts and looking at parishioners. And, and I, I, I actually put a sign out. I was helping serve donuts. I said, ask me what I need. And it was really provocative. And I had all these people come up, a lot of parishioners, long-time parishioners coming up. It was a great way to get to know people by name, introduce themselves and say, what do you need, Mark? And I said, I need someone, maybe you, to scholarship one or two or three teenagers to come on retreat and have a transformational experience of Jesus Christ in this church. The checks could not get written fast enough. In fact, I got myself in a lot of trouble with other ministries because they felt like I was taking money away from their ministries from the basket, when in fact, the basket went up too. These were people giving out of their excess because I communicated need, not just desire, not just want, but need. And people want to give the things people are excited about. People want to give the things that work. If you show you're willing to work, more and more people will give. Well, oftentimes, the reason we don't have enough volunteers, the reason we don't have enough funding or budget is because we're not bold enough. If you trust in your vision and your perspective and you believe in your mission and you communicate those needs and you communicate a faith that, that God will move and he will give you what you need and grant you what you need, God is never outdone in generosity, right? And lastly, 
have fun. We take ourselves so seriously and oftentimes too seriously. Joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It says in Psalms 2, the one enthroned in heaven sits and laughs. If we're not having fun, we're not actually doing ministry, right? We, we, you can be, a, uh, you can be a, um, a programming center, a Catholic programming center, but true ministry is relational and true ministry should have a sense of joy and a spirit of joy because joy is of the Lord, joy is of the spirit. So don't take yourself too seriously. Don't allow yourself to take yourself too seriously. Don't allow the meetings to, to lack fun. Don't allow your ministry meetings to lack fun. There's no reason. Sometimes people say, oh, it's just silly for silliness sake. Well, Fulton Sheen would disagree with you. So would St. Teresa of Avila. So would St. Philip Neri. So would St. John Paul II. All these, all these saints had a spirit of fun and levity that did not mean when they spoke, what they spoke of was somehow diminished. Sometimes we confuse fun with irreverent. I would say irreverence is rooted more in irrelevance than it is in fun. The one in front of heaven sits and laughs. I mean, come on. When, when they named Isaac, you know what the word, the name Isaac means laughter? That was because Sarah laughed at God and God had the ultimate sense of humor and said, okay, you're gonna laugh at me about getting pregnant? That's what you're gonna name your kid. You're gonna name him laughter. Our God is a God who laughs. Our God is a God who, doesn't, who does not lack a sense of humor, right? So don't be afraid to have fun. And don't be afraid to share what God is doing, to share the glory stories. I'm gonna, gonna stop sharing my screen here. Don't be afraid to share the glory stories um, because honestly, that brings glory to God. When we do that, what we're, what we're basically saying is, I, I love you, Lord. I love what you've done, what you are doing. And what it allows us to do when we share those glory stories is to be able to say, is to be able to say, um, this is how God has moved. And this is how God has worked. So oftentimes when we get together as a staff or with ministries, we complain about people or things that we do and don't have rather than really celebrating what God is doing. And when we celebrate what God is doing, we bring glory to God. Well, that is strength for the journey. And that gets everybody to keep moving in the right direction. And it can be a little, it could be a little win. Hey, you know what? This week we had um, 30 people for confession, which is 10 more people than last week. That's a glory story. Hey, you know what? So-and-so brought their neighbor or their coworker or their spouse with them to mass. That's a glory story. You know, so-and-so came back, haven't seen them here in a year. You know, you'd be able to, make, you'd be able to look them in the eyes and say, it's so good to see you and to affirm Christ's presence in them. That's a glory story. There are so many glory stories that happen, but oftentimes in a pair setting with ministry setting, we're so busy. We go from task to task to task and we stop. We refuse to stop and celebrate what God is, or who God is and what God is doing. So those are just a few very big generalizing elements that I've taken over the last several years, working with different parishes and in different parishes and uh, across the country and in other countries. Even though every parish is different, I really believe that principle from Proverbs, that a parish without a vision will perish. And if we're not willing to, to stay humble and invite the Holy Spirit in and ask the tough questions, we are going to fall into monotony. And that's not what God calls us to, because monotony is not synonymous with ministry. Back to you, Aaron. Yes. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, lots of things to think about and um, very inspiring. I, I feel inspired at the moment. Um, and so I invite our attendees to send in maybe a specific question you have for Mark about something that's taking place in your parish. Maybe he can give you feedback or, or a different perspective on it. Um, or, you know, how to begin this in, in your parish. Um, and I guess that's kind of where I wanted to go. What would you say? I know you said start with three strategies right or initiatives mm -hmm. but even going even smaller than that think of the parish minister whose staff has been reduced they feel like they're the one person mm -hmm. show but they really want to maybe change some of this ministry culture in their parish suggestions sure. I'll, I'll give you a very specific example um i so i get invited to to head out and lead parish missions pretty frequently you know, a few times a year and it was really uh even pre-pandemic, pre what was really fascinating to me was that 90% of the parishes that would reach out to me had this structure in their minds of what it's supposed to look like. I'm supposed to come in, I'm supposed to, to give a message at the end of every mass, the Saturday vigil, all the Sunday morning masses. The mission's going to start Sunday night. It's going to go Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, right? Um, I want you know, the, the, when you come stay in the rectory, you're going to come do this, you're going to, you know, you're, and it, it had a structure. It should be an hour and a half long and, and that kind of thing. And when I push back and say, you know, I understand that that was a very popular way of doing things for a long time, but I think it's a pretty heavy lift to try and get people to come three nights in a row for an hour and a half, you know, on top of Sunday mass. 
so it was a perfect example. And, and most most places, they, they just became so beholden to this is how I did it, right? And I and I don't have I don't have um, the staff to pull off you know music at it because I can't ask my 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 music mistress to do that. Or I don't have anybody else to help me with the hospitality. So you know I something to do it this way, and you know, this is what people are accustomed to. But the overall product would suffer because people would show up. There was no environment. There was no hospitality. Um, it was just sort of like, this is what we do. It's just sort of, sort of a microphone on a, on a podium, right? And you just come speak at us. And what would happen was every year, I'd say, do you get the same people for your mission every year? Well, yes, we do. It's the same 50, 70, same 70 people that come to everything. So what if we did this differently? What if instead of me speaking at all the masses, what if I recorded an invitation, okay, that you can show at the masses, you can push out in your, on your parish website, you can push out through you know, social media, through your emails. Um, where they get a sense of who I am, right? It's 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 not as awkward. I mean, people have already been in mass for an hour, and I have to listen to somebody rant for ten more minutes, you know. Um, but but you can send it out weeks in advance, so people circle it on the calendar. What if instead of doing three nights, uh, you know, starting on a Sunday night, we've already been to mass. What if we do it on Monday night or a Tuesday night, right? We do one night instead of three, and instead of trying to pull off three nights, which will reduce your cost, you do one night really well. Where you actually have people come in, you're going to have people bring in, you know, some, the desserts and potlucks. Well, the more people who are bringing things the more people who are invested to come to it themselves. If we have one night instead of three nights, well now, you know what, maybe we can find a little bit of, a little bit of a stipend to help a couple of musicians come in and they can have some worship. We can have some environment. Hey, maybe instead of doing an hour and a half long talk because no one wants to listen to that, including the, the presenter, what if you said, hey, let's have people come in. We're gonna spend 15 minutes, 20 minutes in music. We'll have about a 30 or 40 minute message. And then we're gonna have exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. We're gonna have Eucharistic Adoration together. You know, whatever would be, and move it from the hall, move it to the church. I mean, there, there's a thousand ways to do it. You know, it's been so funny, Aaron. It's, it, it, was, it was such a different way of thinking that at first when I presented this, most parishes said, okay, well, no, thank you. We're gonna go find a traditional you know, speaker, which is fine. It's, it's absolutely no harm, no foul. But what's been fascinating is over the last several years, every time I've gone and done one night, it's had such a better turnout in terms of the amount of people who come, the response to it after, and this is the conversations we have after, like during hospitality time, and then their investment to come back to another function a few months down the line, right? Because you're giving them a new vision and because they're willing to think inside the box. And those parishes that where the, where the pastor or the administrator have done that and have you know, brought me or other people like that in and done such a thing, it really has escalated snowballed. You get more people through the door. It's an easier lift. You can get, you can, that's when you can bring that, that non-Catholic or the fallen away, you know, lapsed Catholic neighbor or friend, you know, or spouse. It's, it's a lot easier to say, hey, will you come listen to some music and a quick talk for an hour than it is, can you come to a three night, you know, parish mission? So I think it's, even if you're from a, a, a tiny staff, a tiny parish, being willing to say, I know we've always done things this way, but what if we tried doing it in a different way? You know, and what, what would be the, the benefit to that? And if you've never done, but maybe like, well, we, we, we can't host that because no one's going to show up. Personal invitation is really powerful, you know, and I, I realized this the hard way at the parish. When I first started, I had to get out after those masses and look people in the eye and learn names and personally invite them. I had to earn the trust of parents if I wanted their kids to trust me. And I had to put myself, you know, make myself available. So I had to go to my pastor and say, listen, um, I need to be at, you know, I need to be at the masses on Sundays. Can that count as part of my work week? Can I do a half day you know, on Friday and can I get out there and, you know, and it's going to make me uncomfortable. But you know what? That's it's not, it's not about my comfort. So I think it really it really boils down to is on a parish level, it's us saying, "Am I willing to try something different? I want to try something new?" And if I have no staff, and I want to look people in the eyes and say, "I need your help. You have a unique skill set. You have a unique ability, and I I know you, and I trust you, and I believe in you. I need your help, and together we're gonna do something amazing." Mm -hmm. Excellent. That's, I think, a great illustration of that flipping that pyramid, right? That it's it's the souls, the people we're serving that are more important rather than just the structure that we're familiar with or the Amen. plan that we're familiar with. Yeah. All right. I got some things coming in here. So um, first of all, first, I want to thank you for your ministry along with me over 25 years. Um, another thank you. Very inspirational. All right, here's a question. How do you nicely replace the members of ministry who are stuck mm. in the, this is how we have always done it mentality? Oof, that's, now that is hard. That's, that's, I'm not gonna, that's tricky. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, when I, when I started at the parish, I had six volunteers and I sat down with each one. And after sitting down with each one, um, I had two. Um, I asked four to, to discern a different ministry. Um, and actually, too, to discern counseling. But uh, just kidding. Um, 
you know, but I think it's, I think that is the challenge because when someone is saying, Hey, I, I, I have a, a love for this. I have a heart for this. Um, this is where I want to spend my time, do my time. Well, they might not be a natural at that. You know what I mean? Like, um, so it's not as perfect fit. So I think what's, 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 what you have to do is you have to be very, very specific in terms of what your goals are and make sure that your goals are aligned with somebody else's goals. So for instance, if you have a volunteer ministry, um, who just is, they're beholden to this, it's a sacred cow to be, to go into an approach and say, you know, I've, um, you know, Bill, I've been praying about this a lot and I'm the one tasked or charged with leading this. And what the Lord's been saying to me in prayer is that we have to pivot a little bit in how we're doing things, you know, um, whether that is uh, our approach, our goal, our tone, you know what I mean? How we're speaking. Um, I feel like this is where we need to go. And we outline, here's, here's sort of like the new vision or here's how I, how I want to break this down. And we outline it clearly on paper. It says in Habakkuk 2, it says, um, if you have a vision, write it down clearly on a tablet so that all who see the vision can, can, can see it and run with it. Right? So basically it starts to get everybody on the same page. Oftentimes the desires we have in our head are not articulated through our mouth, right? It gets articulated through passive aggression, your body language instead of saying like hey this is what i'm thinking this is where i'm going so i would say if you write down and articulate what you want to change and how you want to do it and you sit with them and say is this is this consistent with what you're getting in prayer and you and you don't make the assumption that they're not praying about it even if they're not but say is this consistent with what you're getting in prayer would you take this to prayer for a few days and tell me if this vision that i'm outlining right here aligns with where you feel your skills your skill set is your, your your talents your gifts and would you uh, again, come back and we'll talk about it, you know, and, and you're giving them the opportunity as a mature adult to be able to say, okay, well, you know what, maybe this isn't for me anymore. Or, or, or you know, for, for them, if they're walking, if they're walking blind saying, well, yes, I think I'm very, very good at these things and say, okay, well, I have noticed some room, I think, for improvement, or I think the way that you're coming across sometimes is mistaken by some of the people or whatever it is, right? But it gives, it opens lines of communication. And if necessary, yes, sometimes you have to have a hard conversation and say, I, I think you need to take a semester off. Just, just to take one semester off because you've been in this for a long time, and you know, and we all, we all get burned out. And maybe, maybe one semester off, or maybe a, a semester where you give your time into a different ministry will help reinvigorate something. But this is the direction we're going to go in, you know. And I think this, it really is. It's, a, it's a moment of self awareness. And even if they leave upset, ultimately, the people who, um, people who cause the, the biggest drama or the most problems, um, you know, the, the drums make noise because they're empty inside. And I think it's, I think that's where we have to want to love somebody enough to speak truth to them. You know, um, I had, I'll give you, give you, for example, so like in youth ministry, we'd have core members, we have adults. And I had, I had one specific you know, person that worked in youth ministry for many, many years before I got there, but they had no temperament for teenagers. They were incredibly cranky, very impatient, like, like a really mean usher. You know what I mean? Um, and they had, they just had no uh, a, no natural ability with, with teenagers. And instead of sitting on the ground with them and bringing them close and affirming their presence, he would sit in the back like a disgruntled cop. You know, like I'm here, I, I'm the disciplinarian. I'm here to make sure these kids are, are reverent, respectful, you know? And when I, had, I sat down with him and I said, I, 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 th I think you're a very kind man, but your temperament is all wrong for teenagers. So do you, can I work with you? Do you want to try and change that? Because I know you think it's important to you. Or um, would you consider and would you consider a different ministry? Because I think that your temperament is not matching up with um, the the demographic we're trying to reach out to. Rather, I thought he was going to get angry. You know, rather than getting angry, he was so humble, and not because he was humbled, because he was humble. And he said, "I I had no idea I was coming across that way. This was just always the way it was for me." And I just thought that was like my role and my job. And he he transformed. I mean, he to his credit, he transformed, and he became so much more warm, affirming, loving. And he thanked me. And I mean, I thought I was going to get punched. He literally thanked me because he said, you know, no one's ever told me I came across that way because I think people are so intimidated by him because he seems so foreboding. But 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 when you when you assume best intent and you ask the people across from you who you're serving beside or who are serve, who are serving with you, always assume best intent. And it's sad that we have to say that in a church or on a parish level. But we really do. And that's why it kind of goes back to that earlier. When you're starting your meetings, finding out where people are at personally and spiritually. How's your how's your how's your spiritual life? Is it dry? Is the Lord speaking? Are you just are your prayers just hitting the ceiling? They'll say, How are you doing emotionally? Like just like in your life right now. How are you doing professionally? Where are your stresses? To know that because the minute we show that, the walls come down. And the more vulnerable we're, we're willing to be with people, the more they're going to accept our vulnerability, or well, the more vulnerable they'll be with us, and the more they'll trust us when we have to have those hard conversations. Mm -hmm. 
Excellent, thank you. Another question here. Can you recommend a way to start change when leadership may not be on board or that when they think change is not needed? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say, saying, you know, hey, when's the last time we did a, we did a blind survey, an anonymous survey? And friends are how we're going to parish you know um i've heard you know, I, I was on this professional development thing i heard that there are different parishes that have done this and they've they've um they've seen dramatic results like 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 dramatic improvements in terms of like um you know the basket in terms of attendance in terms of volunteerism and who volunteers because this is this is real this is true the parishes that actually are willing to ask those questions and and they are willing to take a hard look at, at like the responses and how they're doing those are the ones that motivates change. Sometimes, you know, the emperor has no clothes, right? I mean, cut off our nose despite our face. And sometimes you're going to have, um, you know, a pastor or an administrator, somebody who's going to say, you know, hey, if it don't rock the boat, okay? If it ain't rock, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, but the reality is, is like, okay, if we said, you know, if, if we said even on staff, can we just, can we just do a survey on staff? How we think we're doing in these areas? Just make them anonymous, you know what I mean? And allow, you know, the administrator, the pastor, I mean, to see what the people it, with, with no fear of losing their jobs, what they really think, you know, to let the parish, and let's see, if it, let's see, I mean, wouldn't it be interesting to see, you know, parish staff and say, how are you doing scale of one to 10? Well, we're doing a nine. And then you put that same survey out to the parish, it comes back with four. Well, now we have a problem, you know, but now you actually have data. And I think the hardest part when you're in leadership, I'll say this as a leader, when someone comes to me with uh, a problem, that's okay, you know, but I also want you to help be part of the solution. So oftentimes we're going to go to the leadership and say, well, we're not getting this done. And it just sounds like, yeah, it's not just sounds like a personal attack, you know? And, and if I'm not prayed up, then my identity is wrapped up in like my job. That's a really unhealthy place to be. Well, think about it. for most of our pastors and priests, their identity is wrapped up in their job. You, you can't really dissolve the two, right? And they're working long hours and they're expected to hit a grand slam homily every single weekend. And, you know, and, and they're going from place to place to place and they don't have a, lot, a whole lot of support. And sometimes they're alone in a rectory and they don't have any priestly brotherly support. That's a lot. That's a heavy lift. So to be able to say, I want to ask this hard question, but I also want to be part of the solution. And I'm really afraid, you know, I'm really afraid that maybe we're, we're missing some souls. I think there, there, there's, there's some souls out there that we're not hitting, but maybe if we did something a little bit differently, maybe we could get more, you know, and I think just starting there and really, and honestly, never underestimate, pray for them. For those who are, who are in leadership or who are in ministry who refuse to ask hard questions or refuse to do things differently, you really have to start by prayer, committing to praying for them. And I don't just mean, you know, a passing prayer in the morning. I mean, really articulating, spending some time in the chapel, spending minutes, long time, periods of time, praying for them, pray a rosary for them, pray a novena for them, fast for them. You know, the Lord said some demons are not cast out except through prayer and fasting. We can't, we have to go back to the Catholic rule book and go back to our, our strengths. And if we go do that, we will see change happen because sometimes, you know, the, the, the soil of their heart has become so hardened or their eyes or their or ears so deaf and their eyes so blinded that we have to call in divine reinforcements. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Go ask their confirmation saint, their guardian angel, the saint that they're named after. Go ask all of them to inter intercede for this person too, that, that their eyes and their ears would be open, their hearts would be open again. And then when the time is right, strike like a cobra. No, I'm just <laughs> Okay, so last question I want to ask. I imagine that many people who work in parishes are pressured by we need to get people back in the pews before, since COVID, right? What what would you say to them? I'm I'm going to go back to that uh, the example I gave earlier about like a one night mission. Um, it's you know <laughs> when 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 we stopped going to mass, it became um, I think for a lot of people it's like wow I really like being in my pajamas on Sunday and just watching it online and you know like I like you know, listening to the gospel I'm drinking my coffee and you know um, and I think that what we realized was there were a lot of people and this is not to judge hearts who if if we had to kind of redefine and say we're more culturally Catholic you know than than catechetically Catholic and I think to get people back it you know I think that although there were a lot of parishes that thought well the minute we turn the lights back on people are going to flood back and that has not happened. Um, as many people watching this know, I mean, I just while traveling the country the last couple of years, it has not happened, and, and numbers are down across the board in almost every in almost every parish. So I think that creating an event, creating moments um, to reach out to people in a new way, right? Um, to flex that email, flex that parish email database, you know, a personal invitation, a 90 second, two minute invitation from father or from a staff member, um, where you actually see a living, breathing voice saying, "Come, come back." Like, come home. Um, it's safe. We want you here. We've got great things going on, but it's not the same without you. You know, uh, if you haven't been here in a while, we miss you. To really to make it an inviting, affirming message back. 
to set up an event, whether it's like a one night mission or some kind of prayer service that's outside of the normal Sunday liturgies with like on a Tuesday or a Wednesday to do something different where you're not, I'll say confined by liturgical constraint, but you can think differently. You can do things differently. Right. Um, and honestly, it's, and this is, I, I always say you, you go after the, you know, you have to go after families. You have to go after the young families you have to go after the youth because they bring an energy. That isn't to say that the seniors aren't important. Oh my goodness. The seniors are the foundation of the parish, but, most seniors you talk to, they like coming. being around young kids. They like they are coming, but they like being around mm -hmm. families. They, they they like the energy. It keeps you young, it keeps you youthful. It keeps things fun and unpredictable. And they want to have they, they want to feel as though um, the parish that they're going to is going to be in good hands when God calls them home. You know, so so really make concerted efforts not to schedule things based strictly on what works with the parish hall schedule or what works for you, but be willing to do things differently. Hey, you know what? After that Wednesday night mass, we're going to have a one hour thing in the church. You know, we already have people coming for that mass or for that, you know, that, that penance service or whatever it is. But to be willing to say, we're going to try some new things and we're going we're to get really bold in how we invite people. And it's going to be outside of the mass so that people can kind of slowly come back again. Because if people weren't coming back to mass after COVID, that oftentimes means that they weren't being in, they weren't really being um, enlivened by the liturgy or fed by the liturgy. And that could be out of catechetical, catechetical theological ignorance, or that could be because the liturgy is not being done well. I mean, you know, it, it, there, there can be a myriad of reasons, but the point is to be able to get them back and, and to be able to get them back and to come back in. You, you can you can woo and woo and woo and invite to come back in. And it's the same mass starts at nine o'clock sharp and ends at 10 o'clock dull. They're probably not coming back again. You know what I mean? Because that was your one shot. So uh, you know, to really be evangelistic in our efforts and say, we're going to try something new. You know, we're going to have a we're going to have a it could be a festival. It could be it could be a, a movie night. You know, I mean, I, I, I you know, I was in one parish and they they had a sommelier who went to the parish and they did a they did a, um, a wine tasting night and all these couples bought tickets and they came and they brought their friends and they came from neighboring parishes and and it was just different. I mean, the hall was filled. You're like, well, of course, we're giving them wine. Well, no, but it was filled. I mean, like just to build a thing and say that's a success, that's a win because you know what they got there. That they FaceTime with the priest, they got they, they part of a blessing, part of prayer. They learned some of the theology or behind it. You know, this whole Bible study on I am divine. It was really beautiful. You know, so they, they were willing to try something different. And that jump started other initiatives. Mm -hmm. And getting to know new people, you know, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been very, very helpful. Um, again, very inspiring. So I really thank you for sharing your many years of experience with us um, and and giving us things that we can take back to our own parishes and, and work on it, and, and ourselves also. Um, at this point, we always offer a, a discount on uh, a books. Yay. So you are an author of more than 20 books. A few of them you have published with Ave Maria Press. Um, yes. And so we have One Sunday at a Time is your newest for Cycle B. We have Cycle A. Look at that. Beautiful. It's got, it's got color. It's hardcover. It's nice. It feels really good. Yeah. Why did you write no, that I, book, Mark? You know, I'm so glad you asked me. Um, so I think anybody who goes to Sunday Mass, uh, if you sat there during the readings in the first half of Mass, uh, and, you, and you know, it's a reading from Jeremiah or Isaiah, and they say, they say some word that you've never heard of, or they mention some city you can't find on a map, right? Because this came, this is from 3,000 years ago. Or you get to the second reading in St. Paul, who's a really smart guy. I mean, it, it, he, he just loses you, right? His theology just loses you. And, and I mean, I, so many times I've been like, Paul, use a comma, buddy. Okay, you're really smart, but you lost me about halfway through that line. Then you get to the gospel, and you know, depending upon which cycle you're in, you, know, you could be like in the Gospel of Matthew. He's talking about agricultural parables, and you're like, I work in a factory. You know, you get to the Gospel of John, and he goes in some really, really heady, heavy theological, you know, precepts. And then if you know, if, if you don't understand how they all go together, well, then then your, your whole first half of mass, if whether or not it's successful or if anything gets through, is all based on the homily, which isn't fair to do to Father. So the idea was. Um, I wanted to write this, it was a labor of love, and just say, hey, in two pages a week, right, it takes, takes less than 10 minutes to read it. I list out what the readings are as an opening prayer, and then just a, a few paragraphs on, hey, you know what, this, that word probably threw you. Here's what this word means, or here's why this place is important. Or, hey, how do these readings go together? Because they seem really disjunctive. Well, here's the, th the thread, the, the strand that ties them all together. So this is what I have to be listening for this week. Then I have in some discussion or journal questions, if you're doing it on your own, you can journal. Or if you have a spouse or a women's group or a men's group, you know, get together for a, a cup of coffee, beer, a glass of wine, whatever, and you can actually go through the readings together. This becomes your weekly Bible study. You can do it with your spouse, with your kids, with your family. You can do it before you go to Mass. You can do it when you come back from Mass. Ten minutes. 
But if we pour that time in, God's not done in generosity. So the idea was every major feast day and every Sunday, so this, this will take you through all the way through the end of November. If you get, this is for cycle B. So it just outlines every week. Hey, here's two, here's two pages, two and a half pages to help the readings pop and come to life in your life. And so that was, so this is the new one. Um, it just came out a few weeks ago. Uh, it'll take you all the way through November. And then you also see uh, on uh, right here, our Not Quite Holy Family. Uh -huh. um, that was a really, really, really fun book to write. My wife and I wrote it. Um, I was, we were so honored. Uh, obviously, it's not like we, it's, it, it was, it even won a couple of awards, you know, and it was so funny when, when, when you all came to us and said, hey, would you want to write this book? I started laughing. I said, that's the last thing you want is me writing a book on parenting. <laughs> Just ask my kids. <laughs> And um, so, but the more my wife and I thought about it and talked about it, we started laughing and said, you know, what if we did something different? What if we shared a book that shares all of our, mis all of our mistakes and all of our screw ups and all of our embarrassing moments with our kids? And um, it became a really fun read and a really fun, read. and it's like where I, I was laughing writing it, but it was so much fun just to say, hey, you know what? Um, parenting's hard, you know what I mean? Whether you have littles or you have teenagers, you have older kids. So it really is, it's for any and all ages. It's not just for uh, newlyweds or young couples. Um, I, I, there, there were, uh, there's family ministries in different parishes who have picked it up. I use it as a book discussion. The wives and husbands get together, and then they they all, they they've all read the chapter, and they they break into different discussions. It's been a lot of fun. It's been really tremendous feedback. I'm, just, I'm so thankful to Ave Maria just for just for the opportunities to get to share. You know, I don't know my 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 looniness, my my craziness, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. It is fun. It is a fun read, and I think a great gift too for for new parents, for for young parents, for families. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much for spending Thank this you, time Aaron. with us. Yeah. And so if you're interested in any of these books, um, webinar 0116 for today's date um, when ordering at Ave Maria Press. And I invite Stay warm, you to, everybody. That's Stay right. Warm. I invite you to join us February 6th. This will be the last webinar in this series by Donna McLeod um, with Seasons of Hope, uh, bereavement ministry and really just um, extra support and and development for ministers the spirit of mentoring ministry helpers so i'll send you an email tomorrow with an invite to that webinar also thank you everybody thanks so much mark take care have a great day Bye. Bye.